So I'm in the psychology department in the cognitive science program here at Berkeley. Uh, this is what a psychology department looked like uh, about 100 years ago. This is actually the first psychology laboratory, uh, the laboratory of Wilhelm Wundt. Uh, and you know, it's been about 100 years, so there have been a few changes to how uh, psychologists do their work. Basically, if you went to a psychology lab now, it would look more like this. Uh, but really, I think the way that we do psychology is something which can massively change using the kinds of resources that big data provides. So psychologists are often accused of suffering from physics envy. Uh, and there's a spectrum of kinds of physics that we could be envious of. Uh, so at one end, we have sort of lab physics, where you're doing low noise, small scale experiments. At the other end, you have basically astronomy, where you have high noise, large scale observations. And all of psychology really has concentrated down at this, this sort of end of the spectrum, where people, if you ask a psychologist to you know, answer a question for you, they're going to say, OK, give me a couple months and, and uh, you know, a few hundred people, and we'll run an experiment, and we'll answer that question. And psychologists don't really think about the data which we get at this end of the spectrum, where what we're doing is sort of going out, collecting those data in a non-intervention-based fashion, and then trying to figure out what kind of signal we can derive from them. But there are lots of data like that, basically behavioral data which we're not exploiting, things like you know, Flickr, where people are tagging images, uh, data we can collect using mobile devices on different kinds of behavior, and data that come from places like Facebook, where they just have you know, extensive logs of the interactions between people. And really, that presents an opportunity to do a different kind of science of the mind, one where we're making use of these kinds of observational data. So for example, um, you know, there are very large image databases. Uh, this is, a, image, uh, this is, this is a, a figure showing 80 million images. Uh, but Yahoo released recently 100 million images, which are tagged by people in terms of what those images contain. And that's an opportunity to, to discover something about how it is that people categorize things. Uh, there's uh, opportunities to use things like mobile devices to do things like citizen developmental psychology, where we basically ask parents and their children to participate in studies where they can do those studies in their own homes, and we can use the results of those data to constrain our theories. And things like Facebook allow us to engage with questions that are the sorts of questions that social psychologists have traditionally explored in the lab on a global scale, where you can ask questions about you know, how it is that friendships operate between different countries. Um, uh, and my colleague, Dr. Keltner, has been exploring some of these kinds of questions. So uh, these sorts of ideas in cognitive, developmental, and social psychology are ideas that we're beginning to explore in setting up a new center for data on the mind in the uh, psychology department in Tolman Hall. What I'm going to talk about now is just a few of the projects which are going on in my research group, the Computational Cognitive Science Lab. Uh, so some of the kinds of things we're interested in are looking at what happens when we take experiments that psychologists would traditionally run with you know, very simple stimuli and run them with more realistic stimuli, making use of things like large image databases. So we've done experiments on things like word learning, where we will run a large online experiment using realistic images and ask people to you know, answer a question, like if you're learning a new word and here are three examples of things that that word describes, then what other images here do you think those words would correspond to? And these data give us insight into the kinds of mechanisms that are involved in human learning, but also information that we can use for training better machine learning systems. Uh, with Mike Frank's lab at Stanford, we've been working on developing a mobile app for vocabulary uh, development data collection. So the basic idea is that uh, if you have a small child, uh, as that child begins to produce words, the first instance of one of those words you can log. Uh, and as a consequence, we have a record of how it is that children's vocabulary is developing over time. And we also have a platform that we can use for doing some basic kinds of experiments, like you know, uh, if we show the child these three uh, things and we say, you know, which one is the giraffe, can they appropriately pick out the appropriate image? Um, Another project that we've been doing is working on developing software for doing large-scale interactive crowdsourced experiments. Uh, and the focus of this in my lab is cultural evolution. So what we're interested in doing is con conducting experiments where we have people basically engaging in a task, but then the data which they're generating in that task is being passed to another person who passes data to the next person, and so on and so on. And so uh, we developed software which we can use for running these kinds of experiments with uh, literally thousands of people, as well as for allowing us to have interactions that are much more complicated. So basically, any task that you can formulate in terms of information being passed from one person to another person, and then being manipulated and then passed on to another person, you can uh, run large-scale experiments on Mechanical Turk using the software we've developed. One of the ways that I think about using this is that it kind of gives us the opportunity to turn the problem of designing experiments which we normally think about as being something that's focused on the kinds of experiments we can run in the lab, 
into a problem of basically designing algorithms that allow us to gather the kinds of information that we want to collect from people about human behavior. And if you're curious later on, I can give you some examples of the results of some of those experiments. Um, in addition to that, we also work on things like uh, analysis of text corpora, building statistical models of language. Uh, we've done some work looking at uh, behavior in games, and, and we're, we're starting a project now where we're going to be looking at learning in uh, some, some popular uh, online games. Uh, and we have uh, some education projects where we're deploying uh, an online algebra tutor, which is going to allow us to collect information about how it is that students learn in the context of a basic math education problem. So the broader theme here is uh, one of putting the mind back into data. So one part of that is that we are trying to educate psychologists about the methods of big data and the kinds of tools that they can use for answering their traditional psychological questions. And one of the things that we're doing as part of the Center for Data on the Mind is developing a website which will introduce psychologists to those ideas and kind of lower the barriers for entry into this kind of data intensive research. But I think the other thing that we can potentially offer is a way of thinking about how it is that the toolbox of cognitive science can apply to in the context of the sort of more general problems of behavioral data analysis that arise in thinking about big data. So I think the way that uh, behavioral data analysis is, is often done is in terms of thinking about you know, trying to find categories of behavior or trying to predict behaviors or you know, really focusing very much on behavior as a consequence of an environment where that environment is whatever the sequence of interactions is you've had with a website or something like that. Um, cognitive scientists, uh, basically cognitive science came to exist in reaction to that kind of theoretical approach where you know, before the 1950s, the way that people would try and explain how it is that people behave is by focusing on sort of stimulus response theories where you're forming associations with the world and then those associations are what drives you to behave in a particular way. And cognitive science refers to the science of the mind in the sense of giving us formal tools for thinking about the mental representations that might mediate those relationships between the world and behavior. And so to the extent that we want to understand behavior in a richer way and identify some of the latent variables that are behind the way in which people act, then some of the tools of cognitive science might be useful for doing that. Uh, and cognitive scientists are experts in thinking about how it is that minds are involved in particular kinds of tasks. So uh, these are the people in my lab. You might have seen them around uh, bids. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to get in touch. And this is our website where you can read more about our research. Thank you.